Hi everyone, my name is Yaro and you're listening to the Creative Nature Podcast. I think I'm getting back into a good podcasting groove, so thank you so much for your patience and ongoing excitement about this show. Um, you'll notice I have changed the name again. I think there's just lots happening and integrating in the background. Um, I don't mean to be like mysterious in a weird kind of way. I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm taking a long pause from doing new interviews over the summer. And that feels really nice because I have so much good stuff to share with you still from recordings that I haven't managed to edit and upload yet. So, um, so yeah, that's one of the things that I'm going to share today. So I spoke to Cass Otterly for this interview. Um, she's also been in podcast episode number 27. And yeah, just listening back gave me this little wave of hope. I'm so inspired by the way that Kes organizes and lives her creative life and thinks about people and communities and accessibility and it's just kind of really what I needed to hear this morning. I remember back when I recorded this leaving the conversation feeling really uplifted and I just felt the same so I feel yeah excited to share this and I really hope that you'll get something out of this as well. What particularly spoke to me was the way we talked about how the pandemic has changed our creative lives and how things have suddenly in some ways become more accessible and how we really want to carry that into the future. Um, I've been thinking a lot this year, obviously, about how this second year of the pandemic is different than the first. And I think, I mean, we're, we're all in such different processes, right? But I think this the first few months were so full of people really showing up and um organizing so much mutual aid and all these things had moved online and i read this article the other day i sadly can't remember where but it was written by a young queer disabled person and they were saying you know like wow i that was the first time i was able to attend like a dance party or something like that and we really can't lose these things. They're so important. And I'm just as excited to one day eventually, you know, do in-person stuff as well as anyone really in a way. But I also want us to hold on to the beauty that we've created together. Um, and I also totally understand that a lot of that organizing that makes that kind of stuff possible is unpaid. And that's, that's hard work still. And you know, no one should feel solely responsible for making that happen. And I think that's something we need to do together. And I have a lot of compassion for <laughs> for all of us having compassion fatigue as well. I think that seems like a totally normal and human part of the process as well. But yeah, I'm I'm just holding all of you in my thoughts and I hope that yeah, you'll have a soft summer or winter if you're in the Southern Hemisphere and that you're finding little pockets of joy and that the things that have helped you through this past year and a half have in some way kept going for you or that new things will pop up as well. Um, yeah, gosh, <laughs> that was a longer intro than I had anticipated doing, but other updates from me, I'm, I'm recovering okay from my second surgery just now. I'm definitely more mobile than I was last time. I'm still in a boot, um, but I can do really, really small walks, you know, just like down the road and stuff, <clears throat> which is cool. Um, and I just I really enjoy sitting in the garden, feeling extremely grateful that I have that. Um, and pain management is okay as well. I am quite heartbroken this week about the UK government's announcement to drop um, the legal requirement to wear face coverings quite soon. Um, to me, that feels foolish and I'm worried for people. Um, obviously, the vaccine rollout has been really fast here and that's great. And I'm happy to be vaccinated myself. I just had my first shot, but... We also just know that vaccines are never perfect and um, there's still people at risk and I think I yeah I really understand that people want to get back together and that small businesses need our support. I'm totally on board with that. But I just feel like face coverings on public transport or 
crowded in those spaces are just not a big sacrifice to keep people safer and so I'm really yeah feeling that the UK is in this very strange moment where Delta variant infections are exploding and it's summer and you know people want to move forward and open stuff up um but I just gonna say something very cheesy I just want us to be the most compassionate society that we can be and I don't think that's what's happening right now <laughs> um yeah and I know that has so much complexity you know I really also totally understand that people people need to boost their mental health by being with their loved ones I really miss my family I miss my friends from Brighton um all of that makes sense as well but yeah um the pandemic is also far from over and currently there's only 50% of the population here that's fully vaccinated so that's still a good really big chunk of people that don't have uh full protection and and yeah <laughs> so anyway that was my little waffle I am excited to coming back to um creative space sessions later in the summer and I'll announce the dates as soon as possible um in my other business Yara Digital I'm hosting the embodied business community Uh, which is really beautiful and has been growing so much this past year and yeah so I'm just scheduling things out I guess for the autumn and winter so that everyone has a predictable <laughs> timeline of stuff and then I will think about when we can do what weekends we can do the creative space sessions um, and I'm really excited for that and in the meantime that's the last thing I promise I'll share before I let you listen to, interview, to the interviews that I'm holding a free uh, grief tending session on July 31st, 6 p.m. UK. Um, really looking forward to that. I did that last spring and those were lovely. And if you want to join that, it's really going to be super gentle. You can be off video if you like. I'll just guide a meditation. We'll do some journaling together, some optional sharing, a little ritual. I'll share some recipes as well. And yeah, that's just a sweet thing that I guess I want to offer. And it would be lovely to see you there. A link to that in the show notes and again thank you so much for listening hi everyone oh my gosh this this interview has already started with beautiful giggles which as you know is my favorite way to start and i'm having a guest today who's already been on the show before so i'm talking to kes Otterleaf, who has already been on episode number 26 and it's funny this feels like yesterday but it's actually been years ago in 2018 and so much has happened in both our lives since so I'm really happy and excited to catch up and dive deeper um she is the author of a beautiful series of books which back then was only one book called margins and Memorations. and so much yeah like I said so much has happened since so I'm I'm just so curious about to see what comes up um thank you so much for making time today I'm really excited to talk to you again Yeah, thank you too. <laughs> I'm really excited. <laughs> yeah, so for those of us who don't know you, I mean, that's not going to be very many, but in case there is someone who's been living under a rock, um, what, how would you describe your work and what are you currently excited about? Um, ooh, it's a big question. But before I answer that question, I was just, um, I had a really weird fantasy where you made a whole parallel series of podcasts with just the parts before you click the record button, like all the ridiculous conversations that happen with your interviewees. I just feel like it would be really cute. Like, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, uh, totally. That's a that's a really cute idea. Yeah. That would be good, right? <laughs> um, I'm just avoiding talking about myself. I'm not good at it. Um, yeah, I guess the what I'm describing the trilogy as is transfeminist speculative fiction. Um, because, you know, I want my own section in the bookshop and that's what I want it to be called. And by that, you know, speculative fiction has this long history of um, like feminist, queer um, kind of responses to sci-fi in a way. And, you know, like I love me some sci-fi, but I think it's always, I've always felt like it's very dominated by like certain narratives, certain stories of like, I don't know, robots fighting in space or something. Um, And so, yeah, I wanted to write something different to that, something very personal. I still feel like the trilogy is just like, you know, the first things that I wrote, uh, it's almost a cliche, I think, of like, write what you know. So they are very personal. 
And um, I think the new things I'm writing, you know, I'm slowly expanding a little bit. But um, yeah, lots of like struggle and resistance, and like it's it's super political. And I think particularly with Dignity, which is the book uh, that I released last year, the third part of the trilogy, I really started to lean in a little bit into just my love and adoration of um, life, of non-human nature. Like I just, um, yeah, I think I was like never quite sure if I could do that. Would I don't know, my audience like understand that or does it all need to be like really powerful trans women and radicalized sex workers? And it's a lot of that as well. Um, but I was like, you know, I just want to write a nice story about a blackbird as well. Um, so yeah, I feel like I'm leading into that um, lifelong passion really of, um, yeah, of the beings around me. Thank you. That's so interesting and resonates so much with me, this dance between what we want to say and share and how, and then also kind of thinking about what people are open to and, and ultimately coming back to the blackbird basically. Mm. <laughs> and that being so important. And also I really love that idea and I really want that book section for you too. And I can't <laughs> wait for, yeah, I can't wait for that future. That's exciting. Um, so my next question is big and it could be taken in any direction. So feel free to, share as much or as little as you like, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. what the pandemic has been like for you and how it has changed your work or your day-to-day -day life. It's interesting, right? Um, I think the first few months of it was such a whirlwind. There was like, we were just opening um, a new community center in Berlin uh, in March. That didn't work out so well. Uh, it's still going strong. We managed to survive through that um, year of hell, really, but um, it was a bit of a weird time. And, you know, I think I'm I'm quite, yeah, I have quite a precarious life. I'm kind of used to things changing dramatically every three months. So I think a lot of people around me were like, oh, no, this is the first big thing that's happened in 10 years or something. I was like, oh, my life, like, you know flips upside down every few months. So, okay, another big crisis. I can do this. I'm okay with it. And I was kind of born for socializing anyway. I'm like really good at being at home. And and now it's a year and it's a bit boring. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I think I'm definitely just feeling like the winter hasn't really ended. Um, and, you know, of course the numbers are like getting really bad in Germany. Um, so I think I'm definitely getting a little bit of like lockdown exhaustion or something. Um, but it, I think it's really interesting because so much of like the organizing work I was doing moved online. So we had this event planned for, uh, Trans Day Visibility 2020 to do like, um, yeah, like a solidarity event with trans prisoners writing letters and because it suddenly moved online and we had like a week to just like redesign the whole thing um 50 people came instead of maybe 10 and you know we could have people dialing in from all over the place and we could highlight some of the amazing work done by groups uh like books beyond bars and lgbt books to prisoners and solidarity about the and all these amazing amazing organizations and so it just became like so much more possible and i think it's really interesting as well um how moving everything online made things more accessible for so many people right and i think like I, people talk about that a lot in terms of work and that's that's definitely true because a lot of disabled people for a long time were like well i can't do this job unless i can do it from home and they're like no it's impossible how could people work from home and then suddenly yeah, it was all very possible and i think a lot of that's been true for organizing as well i think it's um been a challenge, but also a very beautiful challenge to redesign things, to work online. And it's kind of opened up new new possibilities for so many people. Um, so of course I really miss like three dimensional human beings. And we were just saying before, like, I don't know if I'm a real person or if I'm just like a Zoom avatar at this point, but um, I've seen things work really well and like find solutions um, in the community that I'm I'm living and organizing in, and there's something very beautiful about that. Yeah, I agree so much with what you said. Um, 
that is also, you know, alongside the grief and the difficulty, also the sense of possibility. And yeah, I really hope that working conditions are changing for for the better for for decades to come and that Mm -hmm. no one ever again gets to say that working from home just isn't possible yeah right Mm -hmm. yeah totally i'm so in awe of your creative practice and how you continue to write books over so many years and it's from the outset i know that's totally not true and you and i have had many conversations about self-publishing and publishing and all all the kind of pieces that go into the process but from the outside it looks so effortless you just <laughs> you know <laughs> um, I oh to, i wish <laughs> i have to love them myself but anyway um tell us a little bit more about your creative practice how has that been and how has that changed between your first book and now mm. having this whole series and yeah yeah it's a lovely question um I also have this framing of creative practice. I never really think about it in those terms. I just feel like, I don't know, I'm, I'm such like a born activist. I just think I'm like, oh, I'm doing political work or something. Um, but of course it is also creative. And of course it's also a practice. And I think, you know, practice, you're always improving as well, which, um, yeah, definitely makes sense. It's hard to find the time. I think I'm torn between so many things, like community organizing and you know, like life admin and I don't know, surviving a pandemic and supporting my friends and everything. It is difficult to to make the time. I mean, this time last year, I was finishing Dignity, which was actually a great time to be writing a book. I was like, cool, like need to stay home twenty four seven. Really good time to be like isolating and writing a book, right? Um, and yeah, it, it's. It's been interesting because Margins was the first big thing I wrote. It was certainly the first thing that like more than five people read and that it like ended up being like self-published and published. And that that was so surreal. It's like I was so caught up in imposter syndrome, of course, because why would someone like me be writing a book? And it was, you know, also like having a working class upbringing. I didn't grow up around books. I definitely never had the sense of, oh, I have a book inside me. Like that. just all of that was just like a parallel universe. But somehow it happened anyway. It needed to come out. And then I think since that showed me that it was a possibility, like, you know, it doesn't really pay the bills, but like people do read things and people do like contact me and say like that it's helping them or whatever. Um and I'm like, oh, this is a real thing. And then I couldn't stop. It's like since then, you know, whenever I get an hour, I'm like pushing out another book, right? It's, um, it feels, yeah. I think it's interesting when people talk about like writer's block, for example. I think I just had writer's block for like 37 years and now it's unblocked. And like, if I had a year, I would just be writing the whole time. Um, so yeah, it's, it feels really important to me to do it. It's like one, and it, it also feels really decadent. I think as someone like, you know, sitting here watching the world ending, it does feel really decadent to just like throw a few months into writing a book. That said, it does also feel important and it feels like the work to me, so I can justify it, but it is, you know, it can be difficult when you see like people are not getting their material needs met and I'm just like, they're writing a book, it feels, it feels decadent, um, and I guess sometimes that's okay. It's like I, you know, it's a, it's one of my material needs, is, or like spiritual needs, maybe, is to like to write and feel those connections and to be in that. Yeah, what for me is just like a beautiful and powerful space. Um, I guess sometimes it's okay to allow myself some nice things. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I was just nodding along as you were speaking there and I yeah, just want to highlight that of course that's such a valid need and it's also meeting a need for so many other people. I just know that out there right now as we speak, there are so many people who really treasure your book, not just as a book that they have on the bookshelf, but as something that is really meeting them in such a deep and beautiful space and that's affirming who they are in the way that they really need it. So yeah you know um but sorry i didn't want to interrupt you there maybe there's more that you wanted to say Mm. yeah i mean i guess by politicizing it it's made it easier for me so from the beginning 
you know, with margins. I was like, okay, like, you know, a few people will read it. I will like, you know, keep an eye on things and see whether it's like nice or it's helpful to people or something. And it seems like it was. Um, and so right from the beginning, you know, we were doing a crowdfunder to, to print copies and get them sent to uh, queer and trans prisoners in in the US, for example. So that's like created a lot of these like organizing networks um, with, yeah, different organizations to make it really political. When I went on tour, like sometimes I'm in like, you know, a fancy university in Switzerland and sometimes I'm in a squat and I'm like, <laughs> or in like a festival or something. It's, it's really interesting how it, it almost feels like I'm living what I'm writing, which is so interesting. Like this, like, you know, resistance networks and like these, um, yeah, like practical solidarity things. It's interesting to see what could be just like a wanky art project turn into something like very, um, I guess, yeah, practical and solidarious. And I'm not sure that's a word, but you know what I mean? Um, and, and yeah, and that keeps me going. I think if it was like just writing nice stories for myself, I mean, I absolutely should just to be, be able to justify doing that for myself, but it would be difficult, I must admit. So knowing that it is political, that it feels like, um, yeah, one of the most important things I can be doing with my life, that does keep me motivated to keep going. And then, you know, then I can justify it. And I can be like, okay, great. I get to write another story. Oh my God, I love it so much. I have so many stories. I'm just like bursting with them. So um, yeah, it feels it feels like a really beautiful, um, privileged opportunity in a way. It makes me so happy to hear that there's so much more to come out of you. That's great. <laughs> That's really great news. <laughs> um, you've already kind of touched on my next question, but maybe there's more that you want to say on that. I wonder what is giving you hope at the moment and what you hope our communities are moving towards. And I'm thinking specifically also about like how how can we keep and hold on to some of those beautiful things that have come out of this and yeah, I feel like as as lockdown is easing here in Scotland, I'm all already kind of a bit nervous. I'm nervous both about socializing and suddenly mm. being out in the world again, but also I'm nervous about of us forgetting the kindness and the accessibility and the generosity of this time. It's really important. I know I remember having a conversation maybe it was like March or April last year when like all the mutual aid groups were um appearing and I was like wow this is really beautiful and people were like yeah wow finally like you know society woke up or something and I was like yeah I give it a few months um I'm, I'm not a very hopeful person I'm very I guess I don't know <laughs> pessimistic skeptical I'm not sure what I am but um you know it's like this is beautiful and like let's you know enjoy it and like be inspired by it because we also just have to celebrate our wins as well um and indeed like you know, after the, I guess, the first lockdown in the summer, a lot of those groups just stopped existing. And then by the time the second lockdown, people were just like, cool, I'm all by myself again. Like, why why was this really, I don't know, fashionable for five minutes when we were all like in this, like, wartime mentality? It's a terrible frame, but um, everyone was showing up for everyone. And, you know, like, oh, I know this, like, disabled person on my street and I'm going to bring them food and things. And then suddenly... You know, they were like, well, nobody ever brought me food before. Like, I've been here all this time. Suddenly it became really cool. And then suddenly it wasn't interesting again. And, you know, that's the the worst possible thing for it. I think it it's not completely true. And I think it new things do grow and they stay and they take root. And I think it's possible for us to also really hold on to them. So I think it is possible to know of those things and like but with like a lot of knowledge that like people you know maybe like mobilize their privilege for a few months and we're really into it and then get distracted by life or they just can is that's that's one of the things that happens with privilege and i think like having that awareness i think we can be very solid with it and say like okay but this is still important and okay this was you know this brought you some joy and like um and new connections maybe want to keep doing that. Maybe this is like a really important thing that um, somebody with more privilege could continue doing in their life. And, you know, I've seen that work as well. And I think that those moments are something we can be really strategic with. Um, 
I don't generally like use hope as a strategy because I'm not quite sure what to do with um, good vibes, but and I can't eat them. But I think we can be really, you know, realistic and be like, okay, like people are going to be really engaged with this for a while, and and I'm talking about people, not corporations, right? Like if a corporation is like, oh yes, we can work from home and we can make some more money out of it, and then we'll like go back and uh, um, not be accessible anymore. I think that's a different subject. I think when I'm talking about like individual people, there there is so much possibility for people to also have like learned from that experience and i've seen that where people are like showed up and like learning things and trying new things out and they're like oh actually this is really meaningful oh i like i i could have more in my life i could be showing up for people and that could be really powerful um and yeah i think seeing those things does give me optimism i'm like okay cool like sometimes it's just that people just never tried it or hadn't been exposed to um how marginalized people have to survive every day and like showing up for people it's like oh wow there's a whole of the world i didn't know about um and i think in terms of like less privileged people we've just been doing it forever anyway so i think like i think like pre-pandemic post-pandemic it's just like we've always been in our like mutual aid networks and just like you know getting each other through every crisis um since the beginning of crises really so yeah I, you know i think when i think in those terms that level of resilience that i see that i grew up with that i um yeah live every day i'm like wow people can be like you know resilient and not in the sense that like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger sometimes it just makes you traumatized and like the bad thing shouldn't happen but knowing that they do and knowing that that's our lived experience, I am just so amazed by like people yeah, coming together, creating things, showing up for each other. I'm like, wow, okay. Like, I don't know about hope, but like that gives me a lot of inspiration, let's say. Yeah, me too. Me too. I was nodding along so much. and <laughs> But also, what? You can't eat good wives? <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I wasn't sure if I was allowed to say it, but I'm like, well. <laughs> you are absolutely, absolutely allowed to say that. And I haven't found a way to put them on a grill either. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think with this processing and, you know, with everything that you just described, I think the storytelling part is really so important. There will be a time when we have a little bit more space from the pandemic and we'll look back and try to make sense of it through storytelling. And I think your work is is such a beautiful part of that. So to take that even further, what kind of stories are you excited to tell moving forward? Is it going to be, are you going to expand your um, your current series or do you want to do something else? Are there going to be more Blackbirds? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, for sure. Um, I guess they have quite a few projects on the... Uh, on the plane, on the, well, on the go. Um, certainly, I've been working on a novella, so like a smaller novel, for a while, whenever I get time, um, which has no humans in it at all, which is quite an interesting um, thing to be writing. Um, and, yeah, I kind of have, like... <laughs> Now that I'm like, oh, I could write stories. I'm just, I'm completely over ambitious. I think I'm like kind of have a trilogy in my mind of, um, with a lot of, yeah, for sure, nature connection and all the usual like resistance struggle, overturning capitalism that I usually write, um, but with a lot more of a linguistic element. I think I've, I really explored that with the second novel, Conserve and Control, and I'm ready to kind of, yeah, dive into like, creating languages to meet our needs. I've been studying a lot of like Polari and I'm like very inspired by those things. So I'm like, wow, like what, what would that look like? How, and you know, this is one of the wonderful things about this made up genre. I mean, speculative fiction is not a made up genre, but there's something so empowering. Um, I think also politically to be asking what if, and it gives me a sense of direction. It gives me a sense of like, I don't know. Oh, yeah, maybe a goal and and like various goals. And I think one of the things that's been 
most powerful for me in this, I guess, process of politicizing writing um, has also been like running writing workshops with like other marginalized people or um, I'm working on a course um, that I should be rolling out later in the year of like helping people to tell their stories, maybe of like organizations or like political collectives and things. Uh, because it's such um, an important thing that like can be quite intimidating at the beginning. You're like, oh no, like I'm really busy doing this like important work. How am I also going to be telling the story of my organization? And that's something I know something about. So I like have been writing that course. And I think that's really valuable to me as well. It's like I'm just one person, and I'm and you know I really it's it's interesting as well because I'm not really interested in like fame and celebrity or something i would just like it's just not interesting to me i'm happy to be doing the background work like i always have i feel like i'm writing like maybe it sounds really grand but like community experiences or something and it's been really beautiful for me to use i don't know what little knowledge and skill i have on the subject to encourage other people to tell their stories because there's so many stories that are not being told and i think this is one of the things with publishing that you mentioned earlier is like all of the gatekeeping and all of the access means that, you know, we just hear like a few dominant stories over and over again forever, basically. And all of the really important stories of people who really know what's up um, just never really make it. And, you know, I'm really um, tenacious. So I should have been one of those people and I've just forced my work into the world like a, you know, between 2017 and yeah, probably 2020, I was working seven day weeks and it's super hard to publish a thing. It's super hard to like, also like be someone like me it's, and writing things that I write. Like it's, it's really weird and it's hard to get it out in the world. It's not something that you get a really fancy publishing deal for and, you know, pay rent with. Um, so I just wrote, worked really, really hard because I was really into it and I am still really into it. Um, but I know and it's it's really tragic, like how many people don't have that capacity, but have even more important stories or much more important stories to tell and how they just it just never gets out. And that feels yeah, it feels a bit tragic, really. And like, wow, how different would it be if we knew those things? How different would it be if we heard those voices? Um and yeah, I kind of wish that for us, because I think yeah, we would learn a lot. <laughs> Me too, so much. And I love the conversations that you and I have had over the years about publishing. And so I wonder if people are listening and they also feel like they want to share a story or, or tell it in some way. What has been your main takeaway? What do you wish you had known sooner or would have been different or would have been just more common knowledge, I guess? Hmm. Such a big subject. I'm not quite sure where to approach it, but I think. I've been really lucky. One, that I have the capacity to yeah, work endlessly um, for something that I am really yeah, committed to. And that is not a universal at all, like capacity and like energy and you know, just like the, the ability to keep pushing something through even when it's really frustrating. I know this is just not something that even a lot of my friends have. And um, so those are like privileges that they're just a bit arbitrary, really. Um, I think reaching out to people has been the goal, the game changer for me. I think it has been like really, I guess, like crowdsourcing knowledge, I would think of it as like just constantly asking people all the things because, you know, Google will only take you so far. It's really difficult to get things to be easy, like the easy track where I guess, you know, um, you just sit around writing nice books and somebody's publishing them and you just and they send you a check at the end of the month like I've never had it and I think when those things are so accessible and just like working so hard is not accessible I think just like really reaching out to people because people do want it as well and I think it's really hard for me as the kind of person I am to ask for help. I've got much better at it in the last years, but it's still quite difficult. And I've just forced myself to do it. I'm like, I can't do this by myself. And it has, you know, created like networks and I know practically a community of people who are like supporting Patreon and people who are like giving me publishing advice. Thank you. Yeah. Like, people who, I don't know, just show up in a thousand ways 
And I'm also, that's also a privilege because I just like, you know, have those connections. But I also built all of those connections. I didn't really know a lot of people. So I think having the courage to reach out to people and say, like, I think this is important. I really want this to get out. Do you want to help me with it? Um, is something that a lot of people might be able to find in themselves and might be surprised by how many people will be like, fuck yes, like, let me let me help out with something. Let me do some research for you. Let me deliver this book to a bookshop. Let me, you know, a million things that can be done by other people as well. Um, so I think, and in a way, it's community organizing, right? It's like, this is a really important thing. Who wants to be, who, who wants to do it with me? And yeah, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of possibility there. Yeah, I think so too. And I also love that it seems at least to me that people are writing more zines again and mm-hmm. through the pandemic. And maybe that's like, a, you know, if, if someone is listening and they feel a bit daunted by the idea of a whole book, First of all, books don't have to be very long. My book is pretty short, <laughs> and that's okay. And so wonderful. Thank you. And also, zines are also great. And I'm often thinking about when a zine becomes a book, and I think that's a totally irrelevant question in a way, as long as just everyone tells their story. It's, it's great and so beautiful, mm. right? Mm. It's true. Zines are, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's such a powerful tool and has been around for so long. Um, you know, I am incapable of writing anything short. So I write novels and not tweets because I just can't stop talking and writing. So I would be terrible at writing zines or like, right, I even wrote a zine. But um, I think it's it's an amazing format because it is so independent. All you need to do is like, you know, go to the photocopier. Um, obviously distribution is a whole other thing but there is something so empowering in like okay like fuck the publishing industrial complex I'm going to write something it needs to be out there and then you can just you know send your friends a pdf and you can go to the photocopy and put it in the library like there, there is something really powerful in that and that has always been such a big part of like radical left and yeah also like queer and feminist and uh, so many other uh, movements has been that like really low barrier option and i i love love that you know i'm still i'm still so excited that that exists me too yes you've shared so much beautiful stuff already i wonder if there's anything else that you want people to know about or that you want to share or that you want to ask or that you just feel needs to be known hmm I kind of want to ask you some of the same questions, like what um, what does your creative practice look like these days? How <laughs> how has it changed? And I, I guess, like, also, how do you see it in terms of? I guess this um, tension I was talking about that I have with myself, which I don't think you know anyone should have really, mm-hmm. but between like something being only for myself and just like yeah, this I don't know mm-hmm. beautiful self care. And then, like, doing things for, like, others or for politics or for social change or something. Like, where, where does that kind of sit with you in terms of, like, your creative practice? Because I think it's really political, but I'm, I'm curious where that sits with you. Mm. Thank you so much. That's a great question. And I haven't prepared, but some thoughts come to mind. I think, I think I'm 35 now, and there's a sense of a shift to more of a focus on longevity. I think these mm-hmm. two main project, projects that I have in my life, yeah, with digital, which is uh, web design and small business mentoring and the community, I facilitate that, and then daydream roles. They both came out so suddenly and, you know, so in a way, I, I forced them into the world as well. I loved mm-hmm. how you expressed that earlier. And so in some ways, they also came out of necessity in that when I started my web design studio in 2015, I just I had been working as a freelance um, translator and copy editor for a while, but I was hardly making a minimum wage and it really wasn't sustainable for me. And I was burned out and I knew I couldn't go back into employment. And I taught myself web design really because I it brought together different skills I partially already had. and it also gave me this opportunity to work from home, which is really so important for my, for my, you know, <laughs> survival in the world, mm. really. And um, 
in the pandemic, I, I really loved writing the book. And I think also there's been a sense of reactivity and maybe too much urgency sometimes in the work that I do and a lot of stuff that was really anxiety driven, which makes right. so much sense, you know, like I'm not, I'm not grumpy with myself about that, but I think I'm excited about shifting into a more sustainable long-term pace and really committing to this work for the rest of my life and thinking about what that means. And I think one practical thing that has become more exciting to me this year is, um, it's funny you would ask that because I really haven't shared that with anyone, you know, not on the podcast in any way, but I'm going to mm -hmm. rename the podcast in the summer and I'm going to take a longer break from um, doing interviews and publishing episodes to just kind of either take a totally break or just do solo episodes for a few months um, mm -hmm. because I love interviewing people so much, but I think there's a new, there's a new thing that I want to explore and I have no idea what that is yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, yeah, I'm also noticing that um, I am a bit, really a bit nervous about changing, things changing again, you know, and in a way the pandemic has been really hard and especially having a broken leg for the fast, past three and a half months has, has made it diff more difficult for me in some ways, but in other ways I've become so thorough in a really good way. I've really kind of come into my own rhythm and I feel much more animal like in my body and mm. and how I look at the sky and how I eat when I'm hungry and how I am so much less overwhelmed by life, um, by public transport, by meeting people, by being in groups. And I think there's a part of me that really needed that. And I want to be really intentional with what I'm bringing back in when mm. it's safely possible to bring back anything right so mm -hmm. i i really don't want to feel the pressure of like rushing back to normal i think that's not helpful or or good or attractive in any way to me and i know i'm waffling but i will say one more thing i think what i also found is like in this depth of total isolation for me in the winter where i couldn't walk and my um i was in a bubble with one other household but that fell apart for all kinds of different reasons so in the first six weeks of coming home from hospital, I was completely alone at home. Um, mm. And that was, that was really hard. And I felt so, so grateful to have a garden. And I couldn't go in the garden because I couldn't get down the stairs for the first few weeks. But when I began to be able to do that, it really changed everything. And I built these beautiful relationships with the birds and the plants mm. and just just feel so privileged to have this and have been thinking more about how the garden can be decolonized, you know, and what that means and mm. who has access to land and how do we grow food and relate to it and how do we become more um, community reliant in our food supply chain mm. as well because one thing really that the pandemic obviously has highlighted is how how vulnerable we are in our food supply chain and Absolutely. really how food is like the, the most core basic need and the most beautiful thing we can give to each other. And, and also I think the gardening world, like any other space can also really be full of shit. <laughs> and really, <Right. laughs> um, so, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So my secret is that, I'm, that yeah, my secret is that I'm training as a gardener at the moment. I'm doing a part-time mm. distance course. And I think after the break, that is probably something that this project is going to move towards to relationships with the non-human world, mm. because humans are quite difficult. <laughs> 100% agree. <laughs> So, yeah, thank you for asking. Oh, that's wonderful. That's exciting news. I love that for you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, plants, they're really where it's at in a way, aren't they? Mm. <laughs> and animals and, and humans as well, but just in the right dose, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, we have covered so much beautiful ground, and I really want people to be able to check out what you're doing and where you are on the internet. So. And let us know, you know, where, where can people learn more about you? How can they learn from you and buy your books and hang out with you on the internet? <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess most of the things are on my personal website, which is otterleaf.com. Uh, 
And there you can also find the newsletter, which I send out uh, once a month on the full moon, which, um, yeah, it's a whole thing in itself. I really love that I decided on that rhythm. It was just like very randomly for a long time, just like whenever I had something to tell people. And I'm like, hmm, every month. And then I like, you know, makes me like watch the moon to know where I am in the month. And it's just been really beautiful. So in in the newsletter, um, yeah, that's what I'll be talking about. Like, oh, I did a beautiful podcast with beautiful Yarrow or something like that. Or I don't know, there's a new event coming up next month or something. Um, and then I also put things on the website. There's lots of like, yeah, interviews and all the various like short stories and scenes and books and everything all um, available from there or like links there. Um, and I think that's, yeah, that's the main hub of information. I don't have social media, which is so wonderful. Um, yeah, I'm sure we could have a whole other conversation about that. <laughs> But it, <laughs> we really should. Um, but yeah, that's been that's been really great. I just yeah couldn't cope anymore, and that's been yeah a huge relief. Um, and yeah, like a difficult decision as well because um, I depended on it so much to yeah sell books basically, um, and that's yeah literally part of my income. Mm. But I was like, my gosh, I just need to do the thing that's good for me and. You know, mm-hmm. I'll lose some business and I'll find some other way to make money because, oh my gosh, I couldn't cope with it. And yeah, I think that was one of those times where I was like, I'm just going to do the really decadent thing, not the mm-hmm. uh, thing that I feel like I should do. Mm-hmm. And oh, mm-hmm. good choice. That was so such a relief. Yeah. Gosh. Oh gosh. Yes. Tell me about it. Maybe that is going to be our third interview. <laughs> <laughs> How to inhabit the internet with grace and ease. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, I love that. That's a, oh, yes. Um, and the other website I would mention is uh, aqua.cc, A-E-Q-U-A dot C-C, um, which is the community organization that I'm uh, co-organizing with in Berlin. We have a community center, which is still in lockdown, but will be amazing one day um and yeah a lot of the community events moved online as i was talking about and oh we're just doing amazing things every week of like mutual aid and social equity and solidarity so everyone should just like join us and Mm -hmm. hang out with us Mm -hmm. um i feel like i'm pouring yeah a lot of my organizing energy there and it's just wonderful and has been a lifesaver this year really and last Mm -hmm. year like so great to have yeah, a project alongside just very, very amazing people. Um, so yes, people can be difficult, but oh my God, they can be so good as well. Yes. And <laughs> that's what makes them so confusing, these human beings. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes, totally. Oh God. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm going to add all of that to the show notes in case people hadn't gotten a chance to write it down, but it will definitely all be there. Kes, thank you so much again for making time today and asking me something back and just sharing so much beauty. I'm really excited to share this. Thank you. Thank you too.